Good morning. It's Saturday, December 17, and today we have another fairly famous story called The Gift of the Magi, and it's by an author who used the pen name O. Henry. O. Henry wrote a lot of short stories. Another very famous one is called The Ransom of Red Chief. If you haven't read it or heard of it, find it and read it. It's a lot of fun. But here is the gift of the Magi. $1.87. That was all. And 60 of it was in pennies. Pennies saved one and two at a time. Three times Della counted it. $1.87. And the next day would be Christmas. There was clearly nothing to do but flop down on the shabby little couch and howl, so Della did it. When Della finished her cry, she attended to her cheeks with a powder puff. She stood by the window and looked out dully. Tomorrow would be Christmas Day, and she had only $1.87 in which to buy Jim a present. She had been saving every penny she could for months with this result. $20 a week doesn't go far. Expenses have been greater than she calculated. They always are. Only a dollar eighty-seven to buy a present for Jim, her Jim. Many a happy hour she had spent planning up for something nice for him, something fine and rare and sterling, something just a bit near to being worthy of the honor of being married to Jim. Suddenly she whirled from the window and stood before the looking glass. Rapidly she pulled down her hair and let it fall into its full length. Now, there were two possessions of Jim's. Dillingham's Young's, in which they both took a mighty pride. One was Jim's gold watch, which had been his father's and his grandfather's, and the other was Della's hair. So now Della's beautiful hair fell about her, rippling and shining like a cascade of brown waters. She did it up again nervously and quickly. Once she faltered for a minute and stood still while a tear or two splashed on the worn red carpet. She went on went her old brown jacket, on went her old brown hat. With a whirl of skirts and with a brilliant sparkle still in her eyes, she fluttered out the door and down the stairs to the street, where she stopped when she where she stopped the sign read Madame Sofroni, hair goods of all kinds. One flight up, Della ran and collected herself panting. Will you buy my hair? asked Della. I buy hair, said madame. Take your hat off and let's have a sight of it. Down rippled the brown cascade. Twenty dollars, said madame, lifting the mask with a practiced hand. Give it to me quick, said Della. Oh, the next two hours were, ro were rosy as she ransacked the stores for Jim's present. She found it at last. It surely had been made for Jim and no one else. There was no other like it in any of the other stores. And she had turned all of them inside out. It was a platinum watch chain, simple in design, properly proclaiming its value by substance alone and not by ornamentation, as all good things should do. It was even worthy of the ditch of the watch. As soon as she saw it, she knew that it must be Jim's. Quietness and value, the description applied to both. Twenty-one dollars they took from her for it, and she hurried home with eighty-seven cents. And with the chain on his watch, Jim might be properly anxious about the time in any company. Grand as the watch was, he sometimes looked at it on the sly to account for the old leather strap he used in place of a chain. When Della reached home, she got out her curling irons and went to work. Within 40 minutes, her head was covered with those tiny, close-lined curls that made her look wonderfully like a schoolboy. She looked at her reflection in the mirror long, carefully, and critically. If Jim doesn't kill me, she said to herself, before he takes a second look at me, but what could I do with a dollar and eighty-seven cents? Jim was never late. Della held the watch chain to her hand. She heard his step on the stair, and she turned white for just a moment. She had a habit of saying little silent prayers about the simplest everyday things, and now she whispered, Praise God, mayn't Kim think I am still pretty. 
The door opened, and Jim stepped in and closed it. He looked thin and very serious. Poor fellow, he has only he was only twenty two and to be burdened with a family. He needed a new overcoat and he was without gloves. Jim's eyes were fixed on Della, and there was an expression in them that she could not read. It was not anger, nor surprise, nor disapproval, nor horror, or any of the sentiments she had prepared for. He simply stared at her. Jim, darling, she cried, don't look at me that way. I had my hair cut off and sold it because I couldn't have lived through Christmas without giving you a present. It'll grow out again. You don't mind, would you? I just had to do it. My hair grows awfully fast. Say, Merry Christmas, Jim, and let's be happy. You don't know what a beautiful, nice gift I've got for you. You cut off your hair? Asked Jim, as if he had not arrived at that fact yet. Cut it off and sold it, said Della. It's a sold and gone. I tell you to be good to me, for it went for you. Out of his trance, Jim sing, seemed to quickly wake. He unfolded his Della. He unfolded his Della in his arms. Jim then drew a package from his overcoat pocket and threw it upon the table. Don't make any mistake. Dell, he said, about me. I don't think there's anything in the way of a haircut or a shave or a shampoo that could make me like my girl any less. But if you'll unwrap that package, you may see why you had me going at, at a while at first. White fingers tore at the string of paper, and then an ecstatic scream of joy, and then, alas, a quick feminine change to tears and wails, necessitating all of Jim's comforting powers. For there lay the combs, the set of combs that Bill had wanted for so long. Beautiful combs, pure tortoise shell with jeweled rims, just a shade to wear with in the beautiful vanished hair. They were expensive combs, she knew, and her heart had yearned for them without the least hope of, of possession, and now they were hers. But the hair was gone. She hugged them to her, and at length was able to look up with a smile and say, My hair grows so fast, Jim. Then Della leaped and cried, Oh, oh, Jim and I had seen his beautiful present. She held it out to his, to him eagerly upon his, her open palm. The precious metal seemed to flash with the reflection of her own bright spirit. Isn't it dandy, Jim? I hunted all over town to find it. You'll have to look at uh, you have, you'll have to look at the uh, time a hundred times a day now. Give me your watch. I want to see how it looks on you. On it. Instead of obeying, Jim tumbled down on the couch, put his hands under the back of his head, and smiled. Dale, he said, let's put our Christmas presents away and keep it a while. They're too nice to use just now. I sold the watch to get this money to buy your combs. And now, suppose you put dinner on. Eight dollars a week or a million a year, what's the difference? The Magi, as you know, were the wise men, wonderfully wise men, who brought gifts to the babe in the manger. They invented the art of giving Christmas presents. Being wise, their gifts were no doubt wise ones possibly bearing the privilege of exchange in case of duplication. And here I have lamely related to you the uneventful chronicles of two foolish children who most unwisely sacrificed for each other the greatest treasures of their house. But in the last word to the wise of these days, let it be said that of all who gave the gifts, these two were the wisest. Of all who give and receive gifts, such as they are such, as they are wisest. Everywhere they are wisest. They are the Magi. And that's the gift of the Magi by O. Henry. A wonderful story. Have a great day. One week until Christmas Eve.